Hi, I'm Hannes. Hello, I'm Dominic. And today we have the paper Neural Bam 4 Networks presented by Cao Xing Su. And if you want to join these reading group sessions yourselves, you'll find all the information in the description. Today I'm going to talk about my new paper, uh, Neural Bam 4 Networks. It's a joint work together with uh, our group members, Zhu Bai Zhang, Lui Pakao Wunyu, and uh, of course my supervisor, Jian Tang. So, this paper is uh, going to talk about link prediction. So uh, just as the name indicates, link prediction means that predicting the interactions between a pair of nodes. And it has many different application and instance in real world, like in the social networks, you want to recommend someone to be a friend of another people. Or maybe in the case of knowledge graph, which is the case I mainly work on, that's called knowledge graph completion, where you try to predict something like, uh, uh, what kind of work uh, did Da Vinci paint? Or maybe uh, uh, where is Mona Lisa uh, currently? Uh, like predicting such kind of links with relation types. And uh, another kind of application, which is uh, recently growing in this field is trying to apply link prediction to drug reproposing. So, uh, so for drug reproposing, you have a biomedical knowledge graph and you try to predict uh, say whether a drug cure disease or whether a drug in interacts with some proteins or some uh, say some antigen or antibody some some kind of stuff. So uh, in this paper, so we mainly we are mainly focused to solve two challenges for leak prediction. One is try to develop a method that uh, can be applied to inductive setting. So by inductive setting, we means that. <clears throat> uh, the model is trained on a graph, but it what during the test time uh, it should uh, do some link prediction on an unseen graph. For example, if we train our model to predict the links between uh, members in the uh, British royal family, and we want to generalize our model to a test case where we try to predict the relationship between Canadian politicians, and these two graphs may be totally disconnected, but uh, uh, we we can get some clue uh, from one graph and uh, learn it to apply it to another graph because uh, every graph is about a family tree and you just have the relation of like father of the wife, the mother of something like that. <clears throat> and the, the second challenge we are carrying about is the interpretability of the link prediction models. So if our model can predict a link, uh, then for the second step, we want that our model can output some interpretation of its prediction so that even if it's, uh, its prediction is wrong, that people can uh, understand the, what, what's happening behind the model. And uh, the last challenge uh, is usually uh, concerned when, when you try to apply link prediction to real world data sets. Uh, the real world data sets are usually really large. Like for the general domain, Wikidata that, uh, Notch graph, it contains around 90 million entities. And uh, uh, even for domain specific ones like uh, CPKH for drug reproposing, so this one contains more than a million of nodes and uh, like 48 million edges. So to apply notch, uh, link prediction methods to such large notch graphs, we need to make sure that our method is uh, at least somehow scalable and can, so that uh, it makes sense in real world. So here is a basic background of all the machine learning methods, at least all the machine learning methods I know uh, in this field. I categorize it into four different paradigms uh, from embedding methods to path-based methods and node GN encoders and subgraph GN encoders. Uh, this is all the paradigms before uh, the presence of MBFNet. So for embedding methods, I guess many of us already know that uh, if you, you either know the embedding methods in natural language processing or the embedding methods in, uh, in node embedding or graph embeddings. So the idea of embedding methods for link prediction is you just try to preserve the structure of the original graph in a low dimensional space. And uh, say if you have uh, some relation between the head entity and the tail entity, then you want that there's a, a relation or there's a relative position in the vector space. So, so that the position in the vector space preserve the, the link. And uh, then you can just uh, 
take out uh, some entities and check their relative position to uh, try to predict uh, whether there's a link between the pair of entities. And the second one, uh, which is a more symbolic uh, uh, algorithm, I call it like path based method. Okay, so yeah. somebody raised the hand. Just to, to replay the embeddings methods uh, thing that we talked about. So we just embed all the nodes into some, yeah, some high dimensional space. And then we really just calculate the distances between uh, each node embedding. And if the distance is below something, below some mm -hmm. value, then we add a link. Uh, yes, so for homogeneous link prediction, that's exactly the case. But for knowledge graphs, because we are trying to uh, deal with multiple relations, so it's not a homogeneous distance. Uh, rather than that, we take the relative position, say if it's in this direction, then maybe it's farther off. In this direction, it's farther off. Yeah, something like that. Okay, so if the, yeah. If the node is below another one and very close to it, then it's the child of. Yeah, 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 something oh. like that. Yeah. All right. And uh, for the second uh, paradigm, so path based methods, uh, so this is um, a very traditional class of methods. And uh, in path based methods, uh, uh, we take the, all the passes between the uh, source node, the head entity, and the tail entity. So here we just has have one pass from the head entity to the tail entity, but we can have many, many paths from the head to the tail. And uh, the very basic method is called pass ranking, which you can see it as uh, uh, defining a feature and feed it into SVM. The feature is, uh, I would call it a bag of passes, like, uh, like just a, a draw parallel to the bag of word feature you use in natural language processing. So uh, pass ranking use uh, feature that contains, uh, say, if we have this pass is farther, farther, then uh, we put Y in the bag of uh, passes uh, for the uh, farther, farther pass. And if we have another pass, then we just add one to the, the, to the feature of that pass. And then we feed this very huge feature uh, into an SVM to get the uh, classification result. So this is a very old method, maybe from 10, uh, 15 or 20 years ago, but uh, it actually provides some insights to how to use paths for classification. And uh, later uh, in the deep learning area, people use paths uh, like pass RNs to uh, encode the paths so that they enumerate all the passes be between the source node and the target node. And then for each pass, they encode it with an RN and finally they aggregate the result with some say pooling functions. And uh, oh, more aggressively, people can use uh, reinforcement learning methods to directly uh, draw, draw a path sample and then encode it. And that becomes um, some kind of methods called deep paths. So the third class of uh, uh, link prediction methods is not GN encoders. I think this one is people would be very familiar with that if people use GN for that by default. So typically people can uh, like, uh, like people can use GCN to encode or RGCN for knowledge graph to encode the re representation of the head entity and the tail entity. And then try to predict the link using some decoding function from maybe embedding methods. So you just try to measure the distance or measure the relative position of the representation of this node and this node in the embedding space. Uh, however, later I will show that uh, this kind of stuff has some issue because uh, if you if just uh, encode the head entity uh, regardless of the tail entity, so you need to embed a lot of information so that uh, your head entity can deal with all the possible tail entities. So because the set of all the possible tail entities could be go as large as the other nodes in the knowledge graph. So it's really hard to embed all the information about the blue entity here uh, into a say 128 dimension vector. So th this could be problematic for uh, when you try to do link prediction in a very precise way. And uh, the last one uh, is subgraph GN encoders. So in this kind of uh, uh, GN encoders, they try to cast the problem of predicting a link between a head entity and tail entity 
as a problem of encoding the whole subgraph structure surrounding the link. So this one actually uh, solves the issue of not GN encoders because uh, now you are trying to do this two, trying to encode these two entities as a whole, and you just encode their joint dependencies. And uh, typical methods of this class uh, include seal on uh, homogeneous graphs and the grill on large graphs. However, th there's an issue about uh, this kind of methods is that they have scalability issue because for every link, they try to predict they need to materialize a subgraph and then run the GL encoders on that. And that becomes a very huge bottleneck if you try to do inference for all pairs of links in a knowledge graph, which is just like you try to denoise the whole knowledge graph. Uh, question? Yeah, will you talk about those, um, like the node GNN and the subgraph GNN problems mm -hmm. a bit more later, or should we get into that now? Uh, I, I won't go back to it later, but uh, I, so okay. I, I will just show, show the advantages and disadvantages of the yeah, okay. method so that you can have an idea uh, which method to choose uh, if you want to work into this domain, yeah. So as summarized here, so every method has its advantage and disadvantage. And, and you can see that uh, none of the methods uh, can beat the other methods uh, in terms of all the uh, desired properties. So our, our uh, original intuition is to try to find a model that can achieve the best of all worlds and that's covering the performance, the interpretability, the interactive uh, setting, and uh, also scalability. So uh, we motivate our methods from the traditional methods for link prediction, which can might be dated back to uh, 1960s from the very beginning methods in link prediction like cast index. <coughs> so, uh, so all the traditional methods, they have a, a very interesting pattern that uh, all the traditional methods, they have very good uh, definition of what they are trying to compute for link prediction. Like cast index defines uh, uh, the computation of weighted count of passes between two nodes. And uh, another variant like personalized page rank proposed uh, in the very, I, I think it's proposed in the very late years of last century. Uh, and uh, uh, it measures the random work probability from one to the other. And also you can use graph distance, although it's not a very good metric, but you can use graph distance to measure the shortest path between the south node and the tail node to predict the possibility of a link between these two nodes. So, so although all these traditional methods, they work pretty bad in uh, today's link prediction, but we still can learn some lessons from these methods. First, all these traditional methods, uh, they are interpretable because they can, uh, we, we can always cast their project, uh, prediction into some path and then we can visualize the path so that we tell, okay, this path is bad. Uh, this is good for the prediction. This path is bad for the prediction. And uh, also, all these traditional methods, they are inductive. Because uh, take, take the graph distance as an example. If you define graph distance over a graph and uh, give a new graph, you, you can just uh, run the graph distance algorithm on the new graph. And that's inductive because uh, all classical computer science algorithms, they are inductive. And uh, the last thing, which is very important, is that all the traditional methods, they are scalable uh, via dynamic programming. Like the cast index can be uh, computed in polynomial time with dynamic programming. And the personalized page rank, uh, it has the algorithm called uh, power iteration, which is may maybe some of you already know that. And the photograph distance uh, is well known as the Bellman Ford algorithm for solving the graph distance. So uh, if we take a look at the advantages of the traditional methods, so they, they only has, ha, have one disadvantage, that is the performance issue. So if we can parameterize the traditional methods with some neural networks, maybe we can do something to achieve all the advantages. <laughs> so here I have the, uh, take a close look at the traditional methods and you can have an idea how they run uh, on the uh, graph structure. 
So the case of personalized PageRank is try to predict the link uh, or predict the similarity between a head entity and a tail entity by taking the uh, random work probability from the head entity to the tail entity. So first uh, we try we label every edge with the random work probability so, so that every node that has a sum of one probability uh, going out. And then uh, we try to compute the probability from the uh, head entity to the tail entity. So mathematically, this is equivalent to taking the sum of all the possible passes where each pass uh, has the probability that is computed by the product of the probabilities on each edge. And uh, in the case of graph distance, uh, so we can see this share a very similar pattern. We, we just uh, write the length of the edge uh, on each edge, and then uh, we take for each pass, we take the sum of length, that, that's the distance on this pass. And th then we take the mean of all the, uh, the distance, then we get the shortest pass, and that's graph distance. And we can do the uh, same thing for cut index, although it's a little bit complicated, so I won't demonstrate here, but uh, many traditional methods can be rewritten in this for formulation. So uh, by summarizing this, we propose a formulation called pass formulation. We believe this is a very general formulation for link prediction. So uh, if we try to predict the link between the head entity and the tail entity, then we first enumerate all the possible passes between the head entity and the tail entity. And for every pass, we encode it with uh, something like a multiplication function. And uh, once we encode the representation for every pass, we uh, get the final representation for link prediction by taking the summation of all the paths. So here we use the uh, operator of all times and uh, all plus for representing the generalized the multiplication and generalized summation. So they, they do not necessarily to be uh, the multiplication or the summation operator. For example, if you take a look at the graph distance case, then the generalized multiplication is actually the, the natural summation, but the generalized the summation is actually the minimal function here. <clears throat> So uh, if we take uh, carefully choose the, the right operation for generalized uh, summation and generalized multiplication, then we can recover methods like cast index, like personalized page rank or graph distance, as well as, as uh, for some other pass programs like widest pass, which is uh, usually used in, in the routing of uh, computer networks so that you find the most robust uh, pass to go, go to the certain website. And uh, also uh, it can recover methods like most reliable pass, uh, which is also known as the uh, hidden mark models where you try to decode a sequence. <clears throat> so we can see that the pass probability is uh, very interesting. It's inductive, it's in interpretable. Uh, it, but uh, the disadvantages of pass formulation is that first it's not scalable because uh, we define our pass formulation on the all the possible passes between the source and the tail uh, tail node. So uh, this could go up to exponential number of passes if you ha have many hops. And uh, an another disadvantage is that here we use handcraft operations for the summation and for the multiplication operators. So they are not guaranteed to encode the uh, real world heuristics for link prediction very well. So we want to uh, cure this handcraft uh, disadvantage. So uh, our idea to make it better is try to uh, use two techniques. One we already mentioned before is to use dynamic programming to make the pass formulation more scalable. And one, uh, to solve the handcraft operators, we use neural parameterization to replace the operators with neural networks. And because uh, the dynamic programming uh, is uh, a version, so the, the dynamic pro pro programming is trying to draw analogous to the bellman ford algorithm and the neural parameterization is just a neural. So we name our method as neural bellman ford networks. 
So here I would uh, quickly recap the, the fundamentals of dynamic programming if people, some people are not familiar with that. So the key idea of dynamic programming is try to uh, minimize the computation by using the distributive law of arithmetics. So as you can see, if we try to compute something like AB plus AC, we can just uh, take A out of the, the expression and then first compute B plus C and then uh, times A. So if we repetitively do, do this, then we can save a lot of computation. And uh, this depends on the distributive property uh, of the multiplication operator over the summation operator. So if we assume that our generalized multiplication and generalized summation operators also satisfy this kind of distributive property, then we can take the multiplication out of the summation operation. And uh, when this kind of technique is applied to the pass, we can see that if we have two passes that share the some uh, prefix, uh, if they share, here we just share one whole pass as a prefix, but we can share a longer pass as a prefix. And then we take the prefix out of the computation and then we do the, uh, then we do the multiplication for each suffix and uh, do the summation for all the suffix and uh, then take the multiplication out. So this is the key idea of how you apply dynamic programming to pass problems. So if we repeatedly apply this kind of idea for every hop in the uh, pass formulation, then we can compute the pass formulation in a very scalable way. So the computation algorithm looks like this. First, we initialize uh, something called a boundary condition. For example, uh, in the case of like uh, in the case of summation, we initialize a boundary condition of zero. But if if the generalize the uh, uh, in the case of multiplication, we, we, we initialize the boundary condition of uh, one. That's the probability of one. And if the generalized multiplication is uh, say uh, summation then it's the shortest pass case and we initialize the boundary condition with zero. So here we put the boundary condition on the source node and every round uh, we propagate the boundary condition to its neighborhood. And uh, after this propagation, we actually uh, compute uh, all the prefix that shares the, this propagation. So uh, here we complete the com computation of these three passes and uh, for this node, it uh, these four passes. And for this node, it completes the computation for this pass. And then we can iteratively do that and it covers uh, more, uh, more prefix of the passes. And we can do that like this and do that like this. And for this graph, because uh, every pass is within four hops. So after four, four propagation iterations, so we can see that we cover all the passes uh, from the source node to the tail node but you can do more iterations if your graph is larger. So this kind of dynamic programming actually represents a huge class of algorithms. So for uh, so when it was proposed with personalized page rank, this dynamic programming algorithm is called power iteration. And when proposed for graph distance, it's the Bellman Ford algorithm we already learned in the textbook. And uh, when proposed for hidden Markov models, then it's the Whitby decoding algorithm. So no matter which algorithm it is, every algorithm is scalable and has a polynomial time with respect to the number of nodes and number of edges in the graph. So uh, if we take a look at the, uh, the algorithm community of this kind of stuff, and uh, they, they develop something called a generalized Bellman for algorithm that uh, try to summarize all these kind of algorithms. And uh, the general, so so the power iteration, the Bellman for algorithm and the Whitby algorithm, they are they just uh, work on specific instance of the multiplication and the summation operators. But if we take uh, just to take a more general case, if the operators are unknown, and as long as we assume they follow some distributive properties, then we can run the generalized Bellman for the algorithm to get the answer. <coughs> so I have a question mm -hmm. uh, regarding that. So uh, one of the thing is that you call the algorithms uh, scalable because they, they can scale in polynomial time. Mm -hmm. um, but here, like 
we, we can easily see that if you have a very large graph, and especially if the graph is not directed, uh, because when it's directed, the number of paths necessarily uh, is smaller. If you have a large graph that is not directed, you can have like millions of paths between mm -hmm. two nodes. Um, so how scalable is this? And um, do you, can you like add a threshold at a certain length so that uh, the computation do does not explode? Yeah, I, I, I can write it here. So, uh, let me see how can. So, so for the Bell method algorithm, we, we, we know it's V plus uh, E, something like this. Uh, we, I, I, let, me, let me see. So, so, so it's V times v, v plus E. Uh, but if you only count, if you, you only care about about uh, passes uh, with within t, t hops, then the complexity is O T plus E, something like this. Okay, so, thanks. Uh, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So so in practice, uh, we, we argue T something like uh, smaller or equal than six or maybe eight. That that's enough. Especially in the, like social networks, people are uh, any two people are connected by six or eight hops. Is this the complexity for uh, one pair of nodes, or the complexity when when taking all of the nodes of the graph? Uh, it's the complexity for uh, for 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 a single source node and uh, and uh, all uh, all target nodes. Yeah. Okay, but then if you take every pair of uh, source and target nodes, you multiply that again by the number of nodes squared. Yes, so if you want to compute all the yeah. pair of nodes, yeah, you, you still need to times the complexity with V outside, yeah. Yeah, no, but only times V, right? Sorry? Um, I understood that Dominique said that we again need to multiply with uh, the the size of v squared, but we only mm -hmm. need to multiply with the size of v, right? Yeah, we, we need only need to uh, multiply by v different source node. Yeah. But, so uh, the you, whole, whole you complexity have, uh, is about uh, TV, TVE, something like this. But you, you also have uh, uh, v different target nodes. Yeah, oh, but, uh, we, 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 we don't need to uh, consider target nodes because for every bell method run, we get the result for all target nodes simultaneously. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so th you. this is not uh, much uh, go beyond uh, the embedding methods because for embedding methods, you at least uh, OV square to decode uh, all the edges. Yeah, okay, so how? I clear. Okay, so uh, here we, we would uh, take a closer look at the mathematics behind the generalized bell method algorithm. So our original proposed uh, pass formulation can be uh, written as something like this. So if we compute the representation between node U and node V under the uh, query relation Q, so we take uh, every pass between the, from the source node U to the source node, uh, node V. And then for every pass, we take the product of the age representations on that pass. So for the generalized bell method algorithm, uh, it first initializes a boundary condition. So the boundary condition depends on whether the node U equals to node V. If, if U equals to V, then we initialize some boundary condition called generalized one. So the generalized one, um, can be the natural number one when, when you run personalized page rank algorithm. Um, it, can, it might be the, the natural number zero when you run shortest path distance because shortest path distance always start from zero. And uh, for, the, uh, for the other nodes, we just uh, initialize it with the generalized zero. Uh, uh, like the case of uh, shortest path distance, the generalized zero is positive infinite. And uh, then we run the Bell method iteration. So uh, 
which we, we, we have used some uh, inductive proof that uh, this uh, iterative algorithm converge to the past formulation. Yeah, if we run it for enough time, uh, for enough iterations. So uh, at every step, we just uh, take the the representation from last layer and um, uh, multiply it by the representation of the transition age and use it to update the uh, the new representation of HQUV. And uh, at every time we always uh, add a, an additional boundary condition so so, so that we uh, we ensure that we compute the exact pass formulation. So we can understand this term uh, from the shortest pass distance. So every time when you update the shortest pass distance, your initial Initialization of the boundary condition should always be one of the sh shortest path distance, or at least something you need to cons consider when you compute the shortest path distance. So you need to aggregate this term. So this is our uh, neural. So so this is our dynamic program part, and for the next part, we will move to the neural parameterization of the generalized biomass for the algorithm. So as we can see that the components in the generalized biomethod algorithm are, is very close to some neural networks. If we uh, abstract uh, this part, the orange part, we can say this is an indicator function. We try to learn something that uh, output Q if U equals to V. And uh, for the second part, uh, we can abstract the, the green part as a messenger function in message passing GNs. And uh, for the, O plus part we can abstract it as an aggregation function. So here we just uh, compute all the messages and put this one as a, an additional message, and then we do the aggregation function outside it. So and because uh, previously we already talked that the general Bama for the algorithm is run for single source uh, multi -tar target programs. So uh, in the context that uh, we, we are clear with the single source node U and with the query relation Q, so that we can abbreviate away the U and Q here. And we, our, our notation can only depend on V and that becomes the exact GN formulation. So we, we only encode something on V, but we know that every time we encode something on V, that, that is uh, trying to, uh, be respected to the uh, head entity U and the query relation Q here. So uh, I would uh, like to talk about the design of uh, what neural networks uh, used in this, these components. So for the indicator function, uh, we simply learn embeddings for the query relation Q and put the Q on the, to the node if the node is equal to the source node U. And uh, for the message part, uh, we borrow the relation operators from large graph embedding methods, like using translation from trans E, or maybe the multiplication from this mode, or maybe the rotation in the complex space by rotate E. And uh, we also, for the aggregation function, we borrow from the permutation invariant function uh, from existing GN literature, mainly because that we want our uh, the generalized summation to be comm commutative. So, so commutative uh, uh, is equivalent to permutation invariant when you try to aggregate multiple terms. So uh, we, we use things like summation function, mean function, max function, or maybe an ensemble of multiple uh, permutation invariant function like principal neighborhood aggregation. So yeah, question. Yeah, I have some question regarding like the, the general architecture here that I would like to mm -hmm. understand better. So the indicator function is something that you uh, that is only used at the, the first layer of yes. the network, right? Okay. Um, and uh, how how does it work exactly? Because you said it's one if um, U and V are the same and it's zero otherwise. So uh, basically your parameterization is between all pairs of nodes, right? And uh, the way you initialize it is kind of just a, an identity matrix on, on that aspect, right? Mm, so, so the indicator function is actually like this. So uh, we try to do something like uh, e uh, one u equals two v and the time times the vector q. So 
because uh, as you can see here, so uh, as you can see here, oops. Uh huh. Let me let's see. So so. To to bridge the time, let me uh, comment on the nice colors of the uh, yeah, the nice color choices, but also on the um, the nice not matching it up with the blue and the green. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, then go ahead. Yeah. So as you can see here, so so we are trying to solve the problem about predicting, uh, say the the tail entities given the head entities and the query queue. So this this v uh, takes from all the possible set of uh, 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 entities. So here we have the so for for every for entity v we we. Uh, we initialize it to be Q if V equals to Q. So we only we only initialize for the for, for this, this entity. So this is the entity U, and uh, this is this is the hidden state at zero time step. So we only initialize this one to be the generalized one, and for for the other nodes, this is the generalized zero. Of course, the generalized one and the generalized zero are learned as embeddings end to end, and it's not handcrafted. Okay, thanks. That, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and for uh, W, can you explain exactly what W is? Uh, yeah. So here, the I think I can still. Use the text to be better. So here the w one uh, we we defined it just as a, a a function like like this, just some something transform the relation. But you can also parameterize this as a learning embedding. Say uh, you can also parameterize it as something like uh, just a learning embedding of R. Uh, I, either is fine, but it depends on the data set. Sometimes for some dense data set, the first one is better, and for sparse data set, the second one is better. So here we just uh, write it for a more general formulation, and uh, you can just uh, try to engineer it with different choice of uh, WQ. And here R is the distance between the, the nodes? Uh, I, I, I is not distance. I is the relation between entity X and entity mm. Y. Uh, we, yeah, so this is the okay. relation. Okay, perfect. So it's a function between, uh, of the relation between X and V. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and uh, if you want to achieve uh, inductive setting, then you need to have this function do not depend on X and the V. You, you only depend it on, on the R and the Q. Then it's inductive. And uh, in the case of classical, uh, the traditional algorithms like personalized page rank and uh, uh, graph distance, they do not depend on X and V, they only depend on the R and Q. So we also mimic this case. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we uh, take a back, take back to the look of past formulation uh, with the components we define, then uh, we, we can see that uh, what the past formulation we are trying to compute with our, wait, where's my mouse cursor? Then uh, what, what the past formulation we are trying to compute with the, the aggregation and the message function is something like this. We try to aggregate uh, all the possible passes from uh, zero length to infinite length. Uh, maybe in some, if you run T iterations of Bellman for the algorithm, then it's up to, T lens. And then for every lens, we enumerate all the possible passes. And for every pass, we do a message function from uh, the boundary condition of Q and then iteratively do message with R1 and uh, with R2, with R3 until RT. So if we draw this uh, as a figure, we can see when we try to predict a link from the source entity to the tail entity, we enumerate all the possible paths 
and for every pass, we uh, apply message functions uh, recursively, like this case, message inside the message. And uh, if the message is something from the uh, logic graph embedding methods like the trans or the distant mode, then we, we, we are actually applying chain of relation operators. We try to uh, say, do projection along this uh, path. So this is very intuitive because consider a case if we try to predict if this one is uh, the grandfather of this one, then we try to enumerate this path to see if this relation plus this relation uh, plus this relation times this relation times this relation equals to grandfather. If that's the case, then it could possibly be something like a grandfather. Okay, and but... then we yeah we aggregated the results from all the passes to de decide uh, whether we can trust the, each individual pass or we can trust the uh, distribution of all the pass. Yeah, but uh, what is the T in like what sort of T's do you use in in the previous slide? Uh, T uh, T is just the length of the pass. Yeah. So the how many iterations do we have to do each uh, let's say we have some random nodes or some starting node uh, u and uh -huh. yeah how many iterations do i need now need to do do i have my prediction of uh, whether or not i'm connected to a node v that is uh, five hops away uh so first uh if you try to predict a link uh, uh, between u and v then you at least need the number of hops that's uh, no less than the shortest path between U and V. Otherwise, yeah. you cannot propagate information from U to V. And uh, the, the case is that uh, for large scale knowledge graphs and also for social networks, we know that uh, the power law holds. And uh, if, we, if the power law holds then uh, any two node uh, within, in the that graph is usually connected with in six or maybe at at, at uh, the worst case it's it's not more than 10 hops yeah so what what t do you usually use so uh we, we treat the the t as a hyperparameter and in our specific case of notch graphs we use like six hops and eight hops but uh, we found that uh, the performance uh, is saturated after six hops okay then we have another question Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just good to ask on the previous slide because you mentioned that. Which one? You mentioned that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mentioned something like uh, this is only inductive. You can only do inductive inference if your uh, weight WQ does not consider X and yeah. V. Yes. But like, so what, what, what is what? Is X, I, I thought these are the initial embeddings for the given graph. So any new graph, you, you'll you just start from those initialized to zero or? Uh, you mean initialization for what? <laughs> it's like, what, why is it that uh, this is only, why is it that WQ is only inductive if we don't consider X and V? Uh... The reason is like this. So, uh, for the inductive, we talk we we talk before like like uh, for for the inductive we talk here. So uh, we want our model to generate to the unseen graph without uh, knowing the entity features or the node features. So if you have node features, say uh, if you have features for uh, for for the new entities. Then of course, uh, most of the GS can be inductive from the training graph and to the test graph. So here we are assuming a more strict case that we don't have the access to the uh, node features. So we only requires only use the the structure of the relations, the, like the the uh, the graph structure defined by the relations to generalize it to the uh, test graph. So. We, we don't want our model to rely anything on the node features or any learned node features. Because if you learn something for the node features in the training graph, you have nothing for the node features in the test graph, right? All right. Oh, oh so, so 
in so the w function was creating edge embeddings from node features and the edge relation type uh, you can do that, but th uh, then that makes the model to be transactive and uh, not inductive. Right, right. That that makes sense. Yeah. So uh, I remember that, that even for the transactive case, we found that uh, 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 breaking the dependency of W on X and V uh, makes the performance uh, slightly better. So it's very interesting that the uh, depending W on R only is a very good inductive bias. Yeah. So, uh, so this is all, all for the definition of the models. And uh, for the last part, we will see uh, how can we interpret the results from uh, NBFNet. So the idea of interpretation is like we try to figure out the the contribution of each pass in the final prediction. So uh, just like the case in shortest path distance or the case in personalized page rank. So if we have uh, the contribution of uh, for this five, uh, five pass as like this, we take out the, the passes with the largest absolute contribution. Uh, so we computed this part uh, by uh, by viewing our NBFNet model back to the pass formulation and then try to uh, compute the contribution of each pass. Although uh, exhaustively compute the computation for each pass is uh, exponential in the complexity. So we approximate it with some kind of beam search to figure out the top K passes, uh, top K passes that has the largest contribution. And uh, to turn our neural bandwidth for the network into a real link prediction model, so we add some a few layers to make it to predict the final link because previously we only talk about the representations. And uh, in order to apply our model to uh, undirected graph, so uh, we simply symmetrize the representation by taking the su summation of the HUV and HVU and then feed it into the classifier. And the, the training is just uh, uh, very similar to the standard and active sampling training used for embedding methods and also for link prediction GM methods. So here are the results on standard data sets like Freebase 15K237 and WN18R, and uh, also on the homogeneous graphs uh, like CORA, SITC, and PubMed, uh, where we are doing link prediction. And uh, although on these three data sets, the, the results are quite saturated with previous methods, so we still achieve a slightly better result compared to these methods. And one, one thing uh, to note is that we, don't, we didn't achieve the, the SOTA performance on site C because site C is a very sparse data set. And every node, if I recall correctly, every node has a degree smaller than two. And in that case, NBFNet is a not very good uh, model for link prediction because, uh, because the graph is really sparse and the, uh, the paths are really long. So you need a very deep model to capture that. And uh, using some uh, embedding methods or other GM methods would be better to encode that. And uh, we also uh, experiment our model on the inductive setting of link prediction. So in that setting, uh, we, we try to train our graph and uh, generalize it to a fully unseen graph. And our model with the good inductive bias, yeah, we, we have a, a very large improve, improvement over the existing methods. And for the interpretation, so uh, we visualize the prediction on Freebase 50K237 with the, uh, the name tag of every entity. Uh, so we pick some uh, queries and see what's the interpretation for this kind of queries. Like one query is, uh, what's the nationality of Oliver Hardy? So we are asking about the tier entity given the Oliver Hardy and nationality. And uh, the passes that our model found for Oliver Hardy's nationality is the United States is that it found a pass that is Oliver Hardy is impersonated by Rich Little. Uh, well, Rich Little uh, has nationality in the United States. So Rich Little is an actor and uh, 
he impersonated Oliver Hardy. So this could possibly be a uh, evidence that Oliver Hardy has the nationality in the United States. And the second one is that Oliver Hardy has the ethnic uh, Scottish American and the Scottish American is distributed in United States. So note that in the free base link prediction setting, we don't use any information from the text. So it's not trivial to find that uh, Scottish America is distributed in, in United States because the Scottish American is just given as a uh, individual node and there's nothing talking about America and the United States. And we can see the same case for like Flo uh, this Henley as a vacation in Florence, <coughs> meaning because Florence is contained by Italy and Italy has the capital Rome and uh, this Henley has visited Rome. So uh, we, we can see a very interesting pattern that uh, our model try to uh, learn something like a similarity function between an entity, Florence and uh, Rome, by using something like a uh, contained by and a capital, or maybe uh, another two relations, that one relation is an inverse and uh, the other relation is a forward relation. So uh, G G like in this case is Jeff Hender has lived in Florence and Jeff Hender has lived in Rome. So, uh, Flores is probably probably similar to Rome, and uh, and because this Henley has visited Rome, then this Henley has probably visited Flores. And uh, we also provide a, a website demo uh, to show the local subgraph that is extracted by our top weighted passes. So here's uh, just a, a visualization of the case that. Uh, Winnie the Pooh, the film has released in France. And uh, the reason is that uh, Winnie the Pooh has released in many countries. And uh, also another film called Kill Them Softly has relieved, released in these countries. And the Kill Them Softly has released in France. So Winnie the Pooh should be released in France. And uh, finally, uh, we tested our method on the OGB large scale challenger this year. and. Uh, uh, we also found some interesting results. So for the OGP large scale challenge, uh, it's trying to deal with uh, billion scale uh, knowledge graphs, uh, try to do link prediction on that. So the setting is slightly bit different that we want to rank one positive tail entity against uh, 1,000 1, negative tail entities. And uh, the data set contain uh, 90 million entities and uh, half billion triplets. So this is a very huge data set that means even if you put the data set on a GPU, it at least takes around 12 gigabytes memory. And when you do something like, uh, say, taking the gradients with respect to the age, then you, you double the memory and you get uh, GPU OOM. So uh, the challenge is that we need to scale up MBFNet uh, to deal with this case. And uh, we found that it's, it's not hard to scale up MBFNet because NBFNet itself is an uh, inductive graph neural networks. And we know that there are a lot of methods developed for inductive graph neural networks uh, to scale up them, like sampling methods, layer-wise sampling, or maybe uh, uh, subgraph level sampling methods. So here we, def uh, we proposed a, a trick called bidirectional BFS sampling. So because the, the evaluation setting is about uh, ranking one positive entity against the 1,000 1, negative entities. So we have the positive entities and we have 1,000 plus one tail entities. So we, we do a bidirectional BFS sampling. Uh, for every node, we expand a, a radius, maybe a radius of 102. And then we take the union of all the nodes and edges visited by this kind of expansion. And we only use this kind of uh, this subgraph to run our NBF net to get the link prediction result from the blue node to the origin nodes. So uh, th this is still not enough for uh, shrinking the, the large graph because some nodes may contain very large degrees. So if we visit the, that kind of nodes, we further downsample the, the neighborhood of that nodes. And usually uh, nodes with very uh, large degree uh, makes not much sense because like in Wikidata, uh, nodes with uh, the largest degree is human. Uh, Cause everyone 
uh, every everyone if he is a human, then he has a link to the node human, and the node human has a, a around the uh, twenty million degrees maybe. So uh, visiting that node is doesn't make so much sense when you try to do link prediction. So we we simply randomly downsample the nodes with large neighborhoods. Okay, but the the idea mm -hmm. there is that instead of having like say a hop size or a t of four, you can now mm -hmm. have a t of only two and yeah, still get reasonable um, yeah reasonable. Uh, yeah, so we we so first of notice here we are doing a bidirectional sampling. So we uh, when we do a radius of two, we actually yeah. still maintain the passes of four. Exactly. Yeah. So, and uh, we 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 found that uh, we can at most afford five hops on that graph uh, with respect to the uh, to the subgraph side. Oh. Uh, but uh, there's diminishing re returns after we increase the hops beyond four. So if you uh, just uh, predict that there is no link between the source entity and the tail entity beyond four hops, I think the precision and recall would be already more than 90%. Yeah. yeah. yeah th th that's usually true for uh, real, real world cases. Of course, you can construct the cases that uh, violates that, but uh, in real world, uh, it makes sense. Okay, but then um, what's the difference between the runtime during training and inference? Uh, difference between training and inference? Yeah. So we just have the question in the chat, what is the inference runtime of this architecture? But um, we, we do the same thing during inference, right? Yeah. So yeah, for, for the previous complexity, we only derived the, based on the inference. For training, it looks like that every batch, we need more computation than embedding method because, uh, yeah, I can write it here. But for example, you have this very nice, uh, this table in your, in your paper with the minutes that we need to, to make a prediction in certain cases? Uh, yeah, so for, for, for the complexity, our inference, if we consider doing inference over V square ages, that's all the possible ages uh, uh, in, in that graph. So our model's complexity is, uh, is O V T uh, V plus E. So V plus E is just O, o E. So T V and E. And you can add a D because D is the hidden dimension. And uh, uh, by comparison, the embedding methods is uh, O V squared V squared D. So that's not much difference. Uh, we increase it just by T times uh, E divided by V times. Usually E divided yeah. by V is, is not, not um, very large. So it's uh, acceptable. And uh, during training, so so every batch, uh, our complexity is O T uh, V T E D something like this. And uh, for embedding methods, uh, it's uh, O. It's, it's just O. Okay, we we are O batch size. Yeah, yeah, fair. just the uh, batch size. And the embedded methods is just O B D. Yeah, embedded methods has have a, a significant improvement in the training training speed per batch. But the case is that uh, NBFNet converges really fast. It it converges like uh, even for standard data sets, it converges in less than uh, 0.1 epoch. No more than one apple, point one apple, but that's enough to converge to very decent results. Because you see that embedding methods, they need to train the parameters uh, for every node. Every node has its in, uh, independent parameter. But for uh, NBFNet, because it's inductive, so uh, whatever it learns uh, from a part of a graph, it can generate it to another part of graph and it do not need to visit all the possible links on that graph to get a good training. So, 
so I, I think that that pays off for the uh, high complexity of MBFN and it, it still makes the training affordable. But uh, sorry to interrupt. I, I, I think mm -hmm. um, during your presentation, I think your um, formulation is based on um, a, a single source node and all yeah. kind of uh, target node, right? So mm -hmm. the batch, uh, does this batch refers to um, different uh, source node? So basically you will always use or target node, but you sample uh, different source nodes? Yes, for, for different source nodes, yes. I see. And then the inference, uh, I think the inference complexity should be uh, we squared, right? Why it doesn't contain any we squared? Uh, so while we is absorbed by E because I assume E is larger than V. So oh. V time V time C is yeah it, it's actually uh, something like like this, but uh, you can absorb this term oh. as E yeah okay okay thank you okay but then I wanted to ask like you have this nice table in your paper table one where you have the wall time of uh, different methods um, mm -hmm. when making their prediction for. Uh, Facebook 15k 237. Yes, that's the test. Yeah, but what are you actually predicting there? Every single link in the test set of uh, F Facebook 15k. Uh, it's predicting all the test triplets. So, uh, let, let me see. So, so if we we, we have a ah. Thanks. So, so, so if, if we have the test set, test set contains uh, M positive triplets, then, then we are considering the complexity for predicting M times V links because we are trying to rank every triplet versus uh, uh, V minus one negative examples. Yeah. So it's the okay. uh, time, time for predicting uh, OM V links. And that time in your case is um, four minutes. And what is the, the MV in the case of uh, three uh, phase 15K? Pretty much. B, FB 15K, I, I, I think uh, V is around uh, 50K, yeah, as the name indicates. And uh, M, if I recall correctly, M is. Uh, and maybe around 20k. Okay, so there you you have it, um, Rohit. That's your uh, that's your time yeah. estimate that takes four minutes. Yeah. With MVFnet. Yeah. Uh, although I should uh, admit a fact that uh, our method is uh, a little bit uh, optimized in the speed, and some baseline methods are not optimized in that way. So. So we have a slightly smaller uh, running constant, but for the complexity, I think it's still compar comparable. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. So, yeah, yeah. What, what's, what's your question? Sorry. No, I just wanted to, to go somewhere else and say, just to make sure that everyone caught that it's not Facebook, the data set. Uh, that was just my mistake. It's it's mm -hmm. free base data set. Oh yeah, yeah, yes. And yes. Diplo, uh, has another question. Hi, uh, hi. Th thanks, Anis. Uh, so actually, I had a question about the interpretability. So mm -hmm. when you've always talked about interpretability, it has been about the positive interactions. How do you interpret a negative predicted interaction? Uh, negative predicted in the actual. So, uh, in our paper, we only uh, did experiments on the positive case, but uh, I, I think for negative case, you, you can also find uh, what contributes most to the negative prediction. But uh, your model says that okay, which path is important? Does it say? But it does. It does. Does it ever say? Oh, I, I, How I, 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 yeah, yeah. I, I can explain the, the interpretation part uh, in, in a more detailed way. So uh, what we want to do here is try to figure out the, the way. So if we, we view the past as features and we want to take out the weight. Uh, so, so if, if this x equals to, uh, to, to distribution of, 
hypothesis. And uh, we want to approximate our model, our, our link prediction model uh, with, uh, we want to approximate our link prediction model with a linear model over the distribution of passes. And then uh, the, the path interpretations are the, are the weights, uh, weights in W here. So uh, th this means that uh, we, uh, we extract the passes that if we, we remove this path, it has the, the largest contribution or largest influence on the prediction. So no matter it's predicting for the positive uh, answer or the negative answer, we figure out uh, what, what contributes most uh, to, the, to the final decision. Okay, so a path contributing to a negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's, yeah. Uh, that's interesting. And, and then, <laughs> yeah, we, and then we take the, the absolute contribution. That is, uh, it, it can either contribute it positively or negatively, but we only take the absolute value of the contribution. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so what, one other question that I had. Mm -hmm. uh, See, so yeah, I guess that the paper as a whole makes this sort of interesting connection to generalized Bum and Ford. Yeah. But what does the actual architecture bring sort of that's new in comparison to message passing neural networks? Because I, I don't know if you know, uh, neural execution of graph algorithms showed MPNNs can learn Bum and Ford and their structure aligns with that algorithm. I mean, of course, that's in the abstract domain. And Sumitao, uh, what can your networks reason about demonstrated uh, that NNs are aligned with DP? As in, is, is the architecture basically just message passing neural networks with self loops, but with a message function that's like knowledge base friendly? So, like the complex rotation or whatever. So uh, yeah, uh, I, I think we, we have some connection with the, that kind of algorithm alignment stuff, but uh, here uh, it's very obvious to see that uh, why our neural network can mimic a generalized Bama Ford. So, so the generalized Bama Ford is defined as this, right? And uh, uh, if we replace it with some neural networks, as, as long as we can see that uh, the message function can can be a superset of some valid uh, uh, generalized multiplication and the aggregation function can be a superset of some valid uh, generalized summation. There's a possibility that uh, this kind of neural network can discover some uh, patterns of traditional algorithms. For example, like the case of personalized page rank, this is just a multiplication and uh, this is just a uh, uh, summation. So, uh, if your message function can learn something like a uh, standard multiplication, even over vectors, and uh, uh, the, if the aggregation function can learn the standard summation, then you can mimic the behavior of personalized page rank. Right, but like, doesn't this property hold for all standard message passing neural networks anyway? Like, message passing neural networks have an update function that takes the node embedding and then an aggregation of a message passed from the edge and the neighboring nodes. So isn't this something, isn't this property something that holds for like all message passing neural networks, not uh, just- It's no, not for all the, it, it, it's not, not, not for all the message passing neural networks, at least uh, we, we want the message passing neural networks to have these two terms. So some message passing neural networks do not satisfy these two terms. It, it doesn't depend on the choice of message aggregation function, but you need to uh, align your message passing function, message passing neural networks uh, uh, with with these two components. Otherwise, your your model is not aligned with the bare method algorithm. So these two right, components. So Right, so I, I guess like you need self loops and you need to indicate which the starting. Yes. But then apart yes. from that, it's yes. equivalent to any other MPNN. Yeah, so these two are important. So uh, I would suggest that uh, rather than blindly align it with Bellman for algorithm, 
uh, it's very important to take a look at the mathematics of the Bellman Ford algorithm. Yeah, it takes these two terms. Okay, but then okay. I think it's a good a good idea to go with the suggestion of Dom and uh, mm -hmm. let you let Tao Chang finish, and then we get to some more more questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, I'm, I'm almost uh, about to finish. So yeah, this these are the results on KDD Cup, and uh, uh, we we got uh, almost uh, the best of all single models um, on validation set. Uh, and uh, but we failed because we didn't do well on ensemble. The, the winner do a very good job on ensemble and ensemble the 40 models and increase it from 92 to something like 96. But uh, uh, but we, we still say that our model is stronger than almost all single models reported by the winner and uh, probably NBFNet is the most parameter efficient because NBFNet uh, doesn't learn parameters for entity embeddings and that takes a lot of space if you uh, run it for large graphs. Like uh, in the case of OGP LSC, uh, for 90 million entities, if you store the uh, entity embeddings, you can take up to like uh, 60 or maybe 100 gigabytes. And for NBFNet, our dump is just around uh, 20 or 30 megabytes. So in summary, uh, our model generates and transfer to unseen graph with the same semantics, and that's a very good properties that the com link prediction community wants. And uh, we provide somehow interpretations uh, via top weighted passes and uh, it's scalable uh, compared to other pass based methods and the GNs. And uh, we ex uh, experiment our method on several link prediction tasks and uh, also OGP large scale challenge. And uh, the code is already uh, open sourced. And uh, if you want to play with it, or if you have questions, you can just ask me. Uh, so, uh, mm -hmm. is my mic working? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so, with respect to what uh, you want to mention earlier uh, about uh, to what extent uh, NBFNet is designed with Bowen Ford, et cetera, uh, would it be correct to say that? Uh, Basically, the difference between that and saying that a general message passing network can say mm -hmm. reproduce what Bellman Ford does is that uh, in NBFNet, uh, the Bellman Ford is used uh, sort of say as a computational method uh, within the very structure of the algorithm instead of being something that can be learned via message passing. Uh, I'm not sure if that makes sense. Uh, you you mean that the Bellman Ford algorithm should be provided as a framework rather than learned by neural network? Uh, no, what, what I mean, like, because what was being discussed earlier uh, was uh, to what extent does the NBF net introduce something new uh, mm -hmm. when other uh, message passing networks have been proved to be able to learn things like the Bell and Ford algorithm, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, what I was thinking with respect to that is that th uh, the difference is that uh, whereas other message passing networks might be able to learn behaviors like that of the Bell and Ford algorithm, mm -hmm. uh, in this case, the, the Bell and Ford algorithm is built into the structure of the model in some sense as an inductive prior, uh, such that you can use, uh, you can have an actually path-based model uh, instead mm -hmm. of a message passing one, because by message passing in some sense, you can get path-related information, but not directly. Uh, is that correct? Uh, uh, I yes, that, I, 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 I think position. yes, yeah, and uh, also before we pro uh, before we write this paper, we already uh, realized that uh, Bama Ford is aligned with some sort of graph neural networks. So the the main focus of this paper is more like try to uh, bridge the Bama Ford algorithm with link prediction because it's not intuitive that the link prediction can be solved by Bama Ford algorithm. Uh, when I wrote the paper, people asked me uh, why shortest pass can be uh, can be useful for link prediction. That that's a, a stupid, uh, a very stupid method for link prediction. But uh, now we uh, bridge the link prediction with the formulation of Bama Ford, and that then people can have more sense of how to develop uh, graph neural networks for link prediction. As long as they fit into the Bama Ford uh, formulation, it should work very well. To add, uh, to add to Felipe's uh, comment, like um, mm -hmm. one thing that I have seen in many recent work is uh, really this decoupling 
of uh, the different uh, of the different paths that can be taken in a graph. And that is mm -hmm. something that is uh, a bit difficult to do from um, the perspective of uh, of message passing neural network, where all the path get crushed together uh, mm -hmm. in a sort of um, it's a bit similar to the over squashing problem that that we see. It's very difficult, like when you take two nodes that are uh, maybe few steps apart, to mm -hmm. really assign the, the different path information uh, to each of these nodes. Whether this method um, and um, Another um, two other papers that we recently presented also at the reading group one, which uh, deco decoupled the graphs into many random uh, subgraphs, um, and the other which did random walks, um, also like uh, to provide structural information. Like all of these, uh, in some sense, um, theoretically we thought that they could be captured by the message passing framework, but all the information gets blended together. Uh, whether here, like um, the information from the different path can be more efficiently decoupled. So I, I think, in my opinion, this is why we are seeing more of these lines of works um, recently. Yes. And uh, I, I would like to provide some insights on why NBFNet uh, uh, doesn't uh, uh, meet the over scratching problem. So Okay, uh, find some blank space. So, uh, so if we consi consider consider uh, embedding method or a GM method, so like a GM method, they only encode a, a VD a VD embedding matrix for the head entity, and uh, maybe another VD for the tail entity. Uh, so, so, so it's like head entity matrix. Is VD and the tail entity matrix is V by D. So that, that's for, for node GN encoders. And for NBFNet, it's very interesting that uh, because we are trying to encode something like a conditional distribution, it's like something like this conditional. So uh, actually, the whole kernel matrix uh, we are trying to encode is about V by. Oops. Okay, write again in this one. Uh, v by V by R by D. Yeah. If we run NBFNet for different uh, source node, or maybe we, we can ignore this R here, V by V by D. So uh, if we run NBFNet for every single source node in the, uh, in the graph and the uh, the capacity we can encode is around the V by V by D. So this is way larger th than this one. And uh, I guess this is the reason why it doesn't suffer from over scratching. Because every time we only need to encode the information with respect to a single source node and uh, uh, that's enough to encode in a very low dimensional vector. And uh, this also aligns with our uh, practical findings that NBFNet only takes around 32 or 64 for the hidden dimensions. And if you go beyond that, it has uh, diminishing returns. Yeah. Uh, hello, Zosheng. Mm. Thank you for your presentation. Incredible. I just had a question related to the loss uh, for homogeneous graphs that you show in link prediction. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to know how it adds to the current approach because I guess you are only dealing with the indicator, aggregate, and message. I just wanted mm -hmm. to know how uh, the loss for homogeneous graphs uh, helps in link prediction, if you could just explain. Uh, for, for the loss, we just uh, use something like, oops, we, we, we just uh, use binary, binary cross entropy loss. And uh, between the, say, uh, we, we have a batch of uh, B positive uh, links. And uh, for every link, we just, uh, for every link, we, we random example, uh, unactive links, and then, then we 
uh, do binary cross entropy for for b times one plus n links. There's nothing important. So we just use the standard binary cross entropy loss. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Hey, hello. Hello. Um, can you go back to the Cora Sightseer? Yes. Um, um, so do you guys use, you guys don't use node features? Yeah, we don't use node features. Yeah. Okay. So and the, base, the some of the baselines use node features. Yes. Yeah. My question is like the, the node GNNs on the bottom. Yes. They, they use node features. Um, some of them, right? Yeah. Um, but, the, and they tend to do better than the ones that do not use node features, like yes. the, the path based or I don't yeah. know, the seal use node features. Uh, I I I I think seal doesn't use node features, but for VGA and SVGA, they they do use. Yeah, so like you do better than those, but yeah. those do better than a lot of other methods that don't use most of the other methods that don't use node features. Yes. So you are like. If you just compare to things that use that don't use node features, you are improving a lot. But you are yes. probably learning something much different from like VGAE, right? Yeah. yeah. Like these, like presumably these could be combined. You know, like SVGAE does really well on, on, on sites here. But you said you you had trouble combining node features and yeah, we have trouble combining that. Uh, maybe it's because we didn't spend too much time to find a good way to combine that. Uh, so what we found is that if we combine uh, not features in the input of NBFNet, or either just uh, using post fusion at the very last layer, it uh, doesn't increase the performance significantly. It's just to keep the same performance. So, or maybe we are doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just it's just interesting because the node GNNs are definitely learning something completely different than what yeah, yeah. you're learning. Yeah, um, and the node GNNs they heavily rely on the node features. If the quality of node features is very bad, then they cannot generalize very well. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, okay. so I think that there's a very straightforward future work to see how to combine uh mbfnet with node features because mbfnet currently is uh, on a very extreme uh side it only used the structure and no node features mm -hmm. okay well one, yeah i had just one last question mm -hmm. uh all the uh, some one of the reviewers was uh, trying to stress on the similarity of your paper with id gnn yeah. Uh, can you just expand on how is it truly different? Uh, so it's, so uh, the goal of two papers are very different. So uh, for IDGN, we are aware of that. So th that paper proposed something like uh, inductive coloring and, and try to uh, distinguish every node with respect to the colored node. So that it says that, okay, with inductive coloring, uh, we, we can be more powerful for classification. And uh, for link prediction, they, I, I, I assume that they uh, are intentionally using something like a conditional uh, link prediction. They try to formalize a prediction between U and V by condition on U. And that formulation is exactly the same as NBF, but they do not claim it as a contribution. They just uh, do it in experiments. I still think their main contribution is about the inductive coloring and uh, they, they can be somehow serve as a proof or we can serve, also serve as a proof of their method. Uh, so we can serve as an empirical proof of their method on link prediction and they can serve as a theoretical proof of the uh, the the model, the the the, the, the powerful the, the capacity of uh, MBF net on this kind of task, but uh, they just derive from very different uh, ideas and uh, and especially MBF net connected with uh, uh, make connection with traditional methods like personalized page and graph data and I think this kind of stuff is 
never revealed in IDGN. So they do not conflict with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, so is this uh, in uh, IDGN and paper, is this uh, something I should look at? Yeah, yeah, IDG, uh, uh, it's very interesting that they, they unintentionally develop something similar to us. Yeah, but they, they are developed from a very different motivation. Okay, well, I will definitely have a look. And Derek is saying the uh, IDG and then is completely different from NVF Nets. Yeah, I will have a look as well. But um, something else I wanted to ask you, right, do you, did you specifically look at the, the hop size, like the T that you're choosing for some data sets and like maybe on sites here, look at um, how different T's perform because you said it's sparser and we would need more hops for sites here? Um, for sites, uh, I, I try to increase it to into 10 hops, but for 10 hops, it uh, has a little bit issue for learning that because the GN goes very deep. So I. Yeah. Yeah, didn't figure out a very uh, elegant way to solve that. And uh, uh, for six and uh, eight hops, uh, that, that's the commonly uh, setting, common setting we used in most experiments. And uh, it's not good enough for size C. Uh, and recently, uh, when we tried to run it on another knowledge graph data set, NAIL, N -E -L -L, so on that data set, uh, it's it also has the program similar to site C, it's very sparse. And uh, we also uh, don't achieve the sort of results. So generally, I think NBFNet has some uh, shortcoming in this kind of data sets. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. uh, uh, by contrast, uh, very interesting is that if your data test uh, is uh, dense, if it's getting denser, then NBFNet uh, has has even more advantages compared to embedding and GM methods. Okay. Yeah, do you do you know the actual diameter of one of these three data sets here? Uh, Just on top of your I head? didn't remember correctly, but okay. I, I I think that uh, empirically, if we want to cover uh, ninety five percent of the links present in site C, it's no more than five five hops maybe. So, so no, 95 no. links can be covered in five, yeah, five hops. Okay, well then thank you very much for the awesome presentation and especially for the great paper. I enjoyed it and it will, yeah, more or less was the paper that got me into link prediction now with the lovely, yeah, almost review in the related work section, um, but yeah, also thanks for the awesome presentation. And to everyone else, thanks for the, the participation and the nice questions. Do yeah, thanks a lot. I think the presentation was great and uh, well structured, uh, very easy to follow despite uh, the, the difficulty of the topic. So I really appreciate the, the effort that you've put into that. Yeah, and I appreciate the colors, they're nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, do you have any last words you want to, to leave us with? Uh, no, I, I don't think I have any official words for that. <laughs> what's the what's the future of link prediction? Future of link prediction? Uh, my personal current interest is more about how to apply link prediction in more complicated reasoning tasks, because link prediction is just a, a very small step in the blue picture, uh, the big picture of uh, uh, AI reasoning. You just try to do one step reasoning uh, in knowledge graph, but uh, the case is that the real world program cannot be simplified as a link prediction. So how to deal with like uh, combinations of link predictions or maybe doing uh, multiple link predictions. For example, uh, if you try to predict something like uh, a father's father, but uh, you, you don't have a notation of grandfather in your, mm -hmm. in your database, in your knowledge graph, and how can you deal with that case? Run multiple iterations. Yeah, yeah, run multiple iterations, but the, if you uh, naively run it, then the error just cascades. Yeah. Yeah. We get worse and worse. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. cool, but um, 
but then let's let's finish it here and thank you for this awesome start into into the new year and to everyone else uh, enjoy the the new year as well and yeah have a good start with the reading lots of papers then see you everyone all right great to get into some link prediction works as well and if you want to join our future reading group sessions make sure to sign up for some reminders via the mailing list or via the slack channel and you'll find that information in the description